Well made. Um, I think this goes toward uh, something that we, I, I, I think, is embraced, which is the moving bar. So for the city 10 years ago to post PDFs was, you know, a, a dramatic uh, releasing of, uh, of, of data and information in a way that was, um, you know, kind of transformative, transformative at the time. And now, and there are, and this is that, you know, the treasure trove of data locked in PDFs, albeit, but out there, and that represented a tremendous step. We're now ready to take that next step. Um, but these steps, these are baby steps for a, for a large, complex, diverse city. What I can assure you is in terms of the, the commitment to openness is there. The execution it can often be challenged by where the data resides and how the data has initially been stored. Not to get too technical, there's, these are not really technical issues, and I, you know, I agree with my colleagues, it's not, it's, but there are, there are some of those challenges that abound. There are, in terms of embracing what the federal government has done, there have been discussions um, both within the administration and with city council about how to set an agenda that would follow along those lines. And um, we will get there. There are certainly constraints in terms of privacy issues, confidentiality issues, but the things that you spoke of, that is the public's data, it should be made available and it should be easily accessible. Council of the Sunlight Labs, when he was asked a couple months ago to give three words for what he does, he said, he said waging PDF jihad. Um, not your PDF, the other PDF. Um, but in defense of cities, because I've encountered a lot of these, I think the, the, the responsibility is ours in some ways to show the um, more entrenched factions in cities that are, are you know, maybe not letting go of the data like, like others, um, where the use is. You know, there's a huge hacker community right now that's interested in cities. Primarily, it seems to me, or, or well, some subset of them are interested in it because it's just a brand new set of data, not because they're interested in cities per se. And I'm worried that we, we need to move beyond the sense that um, just having the data solves the problem. You know, it's, uh, you know, uh, Carol Coletto, CEO for Cities, made a comment a couple months ago. She said, you know, if you listen, if, if you sort of listen to the refrain over and over again, you'd think that you could fill a pothole with data. You know, just pour it in and smooth it out and there's, there's your problem. Um, so uh, basically what I'm saying is the, the tougher nuts to crack in city government for data, I think need to see tangible examples of, of the benefit or the savings or the efficiency. This, this is the goal of that challenges, right? To, to have real examples. And so um, part, part of the responsibility is ours data, that even if you remove personally identifying information, you can identify individuals. And I'm wondering how much privacy is an issue in both your work and sort of releasing data and what, what you're considering. He's put out there are the terms of use of, of the, the, what we call the explorations, the visualizations and analysis. So we just pass that straight through. Um, I, I think I know what you're talking about with this, the um, synthetically anonymized data like the census does. Um, and being able to reverse engineer that. Um, it, it's, it's not something we've encountered um, where someone has, is able to, to figure out uh, who someone is, but I think, um, you know, I, I think it is, you know, something that we're gonna have to deal with because one of the patterns that you can pull out of data with analytics is, is something that would essentially identify someone over time. I'll just add, I mean, that, that is one of the most obvious constraints to open data and the philosophy of open data. This is the, the city as being the government and the steward of the data. We have an obligation to protect confidentiality and there is um, a treasure trove, frankly, of very vital and confidential information that in no way can we err. Um, I mean, that is, a, that is a disastrous situation. And so the commitment to our obligation is foremost and the commitment to an open philosophy will will have to be secondary to the commitment of, of fulfilling that obligation to confidentiality. Where you bridge between them is is the challenge. And as you know, our philosophy is to um, is to move forward to ensure there's so much data that is available, but protecting that asset is so fundamental and so critical that it does it, it requires us to be much more measured in how we go about pursuing the philosophy of openness. Media team at Global Strategy Group, but I'm also a graduate student at Yale, 
studying security policy. So what I'm kind of interested in, and you briefly mentioned this, Carol, is uh, you know, in what way can you utilize this data that you have available to actually kind of address security questions in New York City? One other quick question that you don't have to answer is uh, you talked about partnering with students. I'm interested in how you're looking to partner with academia um, to kind of like use that resource. <coughs> Um, security of data. I, 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 I mean, sorry, the security of like New York City. I mean, more kind of like like foreign itself. policy kind of issue, less like personal. I can't comment on public safety. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sworn to confidentiality. Uh, I, I mean, I think you know the, what the NYPD has done with Comstat is that's you know uh, it, that is the hallmark of how you use data to better police and to provide better public safety. And um, it really, you know, it's a launching pad for a lot of the open data initiative and a lot of, you know, what you see New York City doing in, pro in a progressive use of open data. Um, and I will respond in terms of the idea behind uh, the internships and externships is being able to, to uh, have a, um, a more programmatic approach to how we engage with um, technical experts who are you know, in school or just out of school and be able to tap into that, uh, that wealth of information and experience um, and bring that into the city as well as I would hope share some of the experiences that the city can offer um, and have that be a, a, a two-way relationship and a two-way partnership. There's some folks here from CUNY where we already have a relationship of that sort, an IT-specific kind of um, internship program where there's a rotating basis, and I just would like to do more of that. I think there's much to be gained on both sides. Well, it, it, it's anonymized. I mean, actually, the lion's share of data that's out there for cities, and this is just a blanket statement, is demographic and public safety. Um, uh, that you know, places like every block actually got their start doing doing crime data. Um, but what I meant to say is that you know, one of the, the strategies um, it seems to me that would be useful in a city that's trying to open up is to you know have the water department sit with the Comstat folks or the or the whatever this, you know the analytics part of the public safety is because um, it's just that same idea, but for every system of the city, public transportation does it well um, too often. You, know. you can't just put data out and that be done with it. It's sort of an iterative feedback process and. In transit, we see the MTA working closely with the developers to improve the data sets, make tweaks, make clarifications. Uh, one of the winners of Big Apps, uh, Big Apple Ed, uh, had a meeting with DOE afterwards, and they said, "What you know, you scraped these data sets that we weren't publishing, so how can we make those more available to you?" So there's always this sort of ongoing conversation. Um, so have you guys talked about uh, in trying to institutionalize uh, or at least communicate the best practices of uh, the required follow-up and communication? Agencies and developers using data after data has been published. Plus, to maintain and make more robust what's, uh, what's already existing. You know, that's an interesting point about how opening up your data actually can make it more accurate. When the Chicago Transit Authority um, started posting um, bus times, um, when they, there wasn't an API, it had to be scraped. And so, what some application developers would do is scrape that data, and since they had to sort of massage it manually and get to know what was going on, they noticed that there was GPS error that was introduced when the buses would sort of get into the canyon of the loop. You know, the the the, G, the satellites were blocked, but it was it was it was regular and correctable, um, and they saw it there, which and they wouldn't have seen it if there was a a, a public API where it would just sort of stream in, or they might not have seen it as quickly. That went back to the CTA and it was corrected, um, primarily because the data was open and people could get their hands on it. So, you know, at scale, you know, that kind of openness can be a corrective. Um, and uh, sort of a watchdog unto itself. Uh, I guess, I think one question that's been on my mind lately is just about longer term things. I mean, a lot of the data that we're talking about is about very short cycle, high speed, you know, in aggregate. But when you think about um, the water level increase by the year 2100, right? Scientists are saying it's about just under a meter is probably a good guess. So knowing that a lot of urban projects take 30 years, you know, between initial funding or pre-planning to when they get built and how long they last. I think one question that we should think about is what is the data that we need now for the year 2040 or the year 2050? Or, you know, for those people then, what would they have said? I wish those people had this data in 2010 because I think that type of framing might speed up the urgency of um, how to cooperate and get some openness happening. Gardner was saying that by 2012, no, 2020, no, 2012, 
which is when the world ends, in the modern calendar. Um, 20% and here, here's why I got confused. 20% of the non-video traffic on the internet will be um, from sensors, which even if that's wrong by half, that's a stunning amount of data that's coming from just little things embedded in the environment. Plus, with IPv6, which is a new way of addressing, um, there are enough IP addresses available for every grain of sand on every beach there there is. And I'm not advocating that, but what I'm saying is. Um, we're already sensing a good deal. It's totally decentralized. It, if it is all going into the city itself, it's a number of different departments. But I think one of the solutions, um, the reason I bring this up is we, we are, have a project called Rivers for Tomorrow, which is the same idea of City Forum, but with watersheds that uses sense data. And a lot of that is, is collecting stuff that we just don't know what we're looking at or we don't know why it might one day be valuable. So. That's, that's one answer to your question, is that I think when the city becomes very quite literally a read-write assemblage of resources, when the, the street lamp and the mailbox and the curb itself is addressable, queryable, um, we, can, you know, we can collect that data and analyze it for, for things that we don't know we need at the time. 